Okay, well, let's get started. Thanks for joining us. Um, we may have some more people come in. It's a bit of a walk, so thanks for joining us um, this afternoon. Uh, I'm Toby Owen, and this is Tim Bell. Uh, we'll be presenting to you today. Um, and the talk originally was hybrid OpenStack clouds, and, and we thought we should probably rename it after the fact towards hybrid OpenStack clouds, because this is really the beginning of, of our project together. Um, and I'll, we'll get into this in a minute. But start by um, introducing the folks involved in this, this particular project. Um, I work for Rackspace um, in product strategy, um, and I'm based in London. Uh, this is Tim Bell. I uh, worked at CERN, based in Geneva. And the third gentleman there is uh, Merrick Dennis, who's um, our distinguished fellow uh, developer working at CERN um, on Cloud Federation. Is Merrick here? There he is. So, and the uh, obligatory legal slide. Um, so let me walk through the agenda real quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Tim to introduce CERN and, and their use case. But um, so we'll start with introducing what CERN is as an organization, um, what they're doing to evolve their IT infrastructure from a grid computing model into a, a cloud computing model based on OpenStack. And we'll talk a little bit about Open Labs, which is a project that we're engaged in together, uh, what that is and, and what we're doing. Um, we'll talk through kind of the use case for federation, uh, federating OpenStack clouds, um, get into some details of, of what we've done so far in the project and then sort of a, a glance ahead at, at what we'll be doing over the next year. Tim. This one? Yeah, great. Um, just out of interest, uh, how many of you uh, know what goes on at CERN? OK, that's good. So uh, I'll go through these part uh, relatively uh, quickly, uh, just filling in some background for the guys uh, who don't know the details. So. Um, we're the guys uh, who are basically running the largest piece of scientific equipment in the world. Um, it's a 27-kilometer uh, tunnel and an accelerator buried 100 meters underground uh, near the Alps in Geneva. Um, our basic goal is to understand how the universe works and what's it made of. And we do this by sending around beams of particles and colliding them together. The beams themselves have the energy of a high-speed train. So if you imagine doing this about 11,000 times a second, collide them together, that's a lot of train wrecks that we have to analyze. The analysis takes place using cathedral size uh, cameras. These things are um, uh, hundreds of megapixel cameras. They record the collisions, and then based off that, we understand what has been the fundamental particles that are involved. Um, for those of you that have followed physics news recently, Based on the research work we did, uh, Professor Higgs and Engelbert collected the Nobel Prize uh, a few weeks ago, uh, and uh, this was the work that uh, helped them do that. So to focus on some of the aspects that we come to around the cloud work, um, I need to explain a little bit about how we actually work on the data. The detectors themselves record about one petabyte a second. So this is serious amounts of data that need to be filtered down. Um, at the first level, we do that with a set of hardware. And then after that, the data itself is sent to large farms of servers. These are generally around 1,000 to 1,500 standard uh, Intel-based uh, CPUs. And their job is to look at the collisions themselves and try and work out which ones are interesting and which ones are not. At the moment, we're in a situation where we're upgrading the, the accelerator. Um, we ran for the first four years from 2009 to 2013. We now have two years during which we warm up the accelerator to room temperature from minus 271 degrees Kelvin and are now moving on to a situation where in 18 months, in 2015, we will then be turning it back on again. So what do we get at the end of that? We have a large data problem, around 110 petabytes at the moment. We're adding about 35 petabytes a year, probably going up to about 50 petabytes a year when we turn the accelerator back on again. The physicists want us to keep this data for about 20 years, minimum. How do we do it? Uh, large piles of tapes, currently about 46,000, uh, 160 tape drives. So it's a pretty intensive data management problem. However, associated with that is then the problem of what do you do with all of this data? 
And this is where, when we came to start to analyze the data and work out the architecture under which we could be analyzing this volume of data, this complexity of data, at the time, the technologies that were available were grid technologies. Based on the Globus toolkits, these allow us to construct a hierarchical system of data centers. So at the center, there's the tier zero center at CERN. This is where we receive the data from the accelerator and we make sure there's a copy that's stored and kept. We then send that data round to 11 other centers. So at minimum, the data is one copy at CERN, one copy of the other 11 centers. And those 11 centers then communicate out to 100 other organizations, universities, research labs around the world. So as far as a grid structure goes, it was very hierarchical clear roles, the tier zero, large quantities of storage, the tier ones, some local tape storage, and the tier twos, no local storage at all. Equally, the workloads were distributed so that the tier twos were used mainly for simulation. So that's trying to work out, given theory, what should collisions look like, and end user analysis, where you take a small amount of data and work out, does it match the theory? So as an environment, this has provided us very, very useful computing capacity for the past four years that we've been running the LHC. However, it became increasingly clear that we needed a more flexible model as we go forward. Um, the structure of software around this hierarchical distribution of data involves a lot of code, and much of that is unique to the research and the high energy physics environments. This is not something that in the longer term is a sustainable model. So we need to be sure we're in a mode where we are following the standards that industry is defining because in the end, that's the sustainable direction to be working in. So then we have the challenge. And this is modeled on the, uh, the head of the worldwide computing grid, Ian Bird. Um, so grids in themselves, it's a distributed system with a single form of credentials. Um, we use the X509 certificate standard to validate a user. And with that, then the user is able to access the resources across the whole grid. They have associated with themselves a concept of an organization which defines which resources they should be allocated to and equally the priority of the work they're doing. Users find X509 certificates extremely hard work to manage. They find the using of the grid interfaces also to be somewhat confusing. And at the same time, the users are starting to look towards cloud computing, which they're encountering in their everyday lives, as being an alternative and simpler model under which we could be doing this work. However, clouds themselves provide you a data center concept. So it provides you with an endpoint. There is no structure to them to allow those, those clouds to be connected and structured together. So in moving from a grid to a cloud, you lose that structure and that ability to share. The two technologies are actually very complementary. Um, at the moment at CERN, we are rolling out the OpenStack cloud uh, for the use in the tier zero. And in this case, we're actually deploying a fair amount of the resources to run grid computing on top of a cloud. So we take the legacy grid software, we instantiate virtual machines, and we run those virtual machines on the cloud. At such time as users want cloud resources, then we can reduce the amount of grid resources and allocate them more cloud resources. So using a cloud as the underlying technology gives us a lot of flexibility. At the same time, when we look at the computing models, we're using a model here from cloud scaling. Um, Randy Bias is always a great guy to go to when you need a picture and a clear explanation. So what we have is a situation where at the top level, we have what we would call the classical uh, parallel programming, MPI, low latency connections. CERN doesn't actually have that much technology in this area. We use largely standard Ethernet connection between our servers. We have a few programs such as the ones in engineering that need to analyze the detector geometries and the large-scale engineering stresses and strains airflow. But the majority of our computing models is actually down in the high throughput, high scalability computing. If you bear in mind, we've got 11,000 collisions a second. It's very easy to take the first collision and give it to one virtual machine, take the second collision and give it to another virtual machine. We are embarrassingly parallel in terms of our model. So that allows us to be considering different approaches to how we can do computing. So where we come across situations like this, situations where we can see technology changing, 
we have a framework under which we can collaborate with industry and investigate these areas. So the CERN Open Lab is an ability for various organizations, commercial organizations, to work with CERN and use the extreme computing challenges of the Large Hadron Collider to then work on what should be the future computing technologies to address the CERN use cases. So example companies are Oracle, uh, large-scale databases, Intel, process technology, HP on the networking, Siemens on control, and we have a new member recently, Rackspace, to work with us on this area that I'm describing here. So the aim behind this is get into a virtuous cycle. So basically, we take an extreme computing challenge. We then apply that and do research into what are the computing technologies that we need in order to solve that problem. With that, we then take solutions in this area and we throw them at the other end of this high-speed train of one petabyte a second of data and see how they cope. And eventually that comes around into the standard product streams that we can then take advantage of in large-scale production. So as part of this work, uh, early on in this year, we started to use the Rackspace public cloud. Um, here we were taking simulation workload. This is trying to simulate the universe rather than analyzing the results of the experiment. And we ran that through in the Rackspace public cloud. The benefit of this work is it's high CPU, low disk I.O., and in particular, very low network I.O. So this is exactly the kind of workload where when the CERN computer center starts to get full, we can be looking to take this workload and move it out to a public cloud and then allocate the CERN computing resources where we need the high I.O. throughput to the data. These tests were very successful. We ran CERN standard workloads in a very short time, getting them up and running with good reliability. So it showed that we can use clouds outside of the CERN main one. And then as we started to reflect on where this could go, we then said, well now, if we take this as a further extension, we've got the CERN private cloud, currently about 22,000 cores, going up to about 300,000 cores in the next 18 months. We have the Rackspace public clouds. So those we could potentially be taking advantage of if we can find an easy way for the visitors to move their workload between the two sites. At the same time, you might remember those large computing farms that are sitting right next door to the accelerator. Since we're doing the upgrade at the moment, those farms are not being used. In fact, one of the problems for one of them is that they have a condensation problem. So they need to be leaving the machines on in order to avoid an excessive level of humidity in the servers. So why not use them for something productive? So there are two large trigger farms in the Atlas experiment and the CMS experiment. Um, each one heading towards uh, 10,000, 20,000 cores. So what the guys have done is they've spun open stack clouds on those. Now, the CERN IT department, the central IT department, doesn't manage it. It's managed by the experiments. So we've got independent clouds sharing the same technologies. Meanwhile, other sites, high energy physics computing sites, are also starting to deploy OpenStack. So IM2P3 in Lyon, the Brookhaven National Laboratory outside New York, the Nectar Center in Australia, and many others. For example, we've just heard that the IHEP Center in Beijing is uh, deploying the OpenStack cloud too. Now, what this means is we've got a large pool of resources there that's currently a set of islands. And that's when we asked ourselves the question, of, is there a way under which we can get an easier scenario for the physicists to be using these resources rather than the current structure of multiple separate islands? Let's pass it to Toby. So this is um, very recently, actually, we officially started our, uh, our Open Lab project with CERN. Um, kicked off the 1st of October, so just a month ago. Um, and we do have a full-time developer uh, who I introduced at the beginning, Merrick. Um, so he, he's working full-time on um, the project that I'm about to describe, um, uh, entirely in the OpenStack community uh, to help with the problem that, that Tim just described. How do we take all of these similar tech, technically based clouds, right, but they're operating independently and start to make them um, a, a viable replacement for the grid technology that they're, that they're using today? Um, 
So we defined a success criteria for this, which is can we demonstrate federated identity and then additionally some aggregated services across these clouds. Um, and, and we're going to start as a target um, a private cloud that we've installed on, on some of the equipment at the CERN data center uh, connecting to the Rackspace public cloud. Both are OpenStack based. Um, or potentially a, a different cloud. Uh, to look at it graphically, um, these are the potential use cases, right? We've got a public cloud running OpenStack. Um, we've got uh, the, the test OpenStack private cloud that, that we've built um, for this project. And we've got um, actually several OpenStack clouds that CERN has um, built and, and managed. And really, any of these permutations um, could be a, a valid use case. So some of the goals we have um, for this, this year of, of research, one is to develop a reference architecture for how we can federate OpenStack clouds. Um, along the way, um, and actually some of this work has already started, I'll get to that in a minute, um, hope to contribute lots of blueprints and code as we progress through this um, to the community, uh, as well as uh, outputting um, talks like this. This is sort of a very early status update, so we don't have a lot of progress to, to report, but we hope over time that, that there'll be more significant contributions. Um, and, and then more sort of technical white paper so others can build on the work that we're doing here together. So how are we doing this? Well, I mentioned we've, we've deployed a, a, a small private cloud that's just a test bed for us to, to try things out, try new code out uh, without getting too much into the, the production environment that CERN is still actively running um, in, in their um, data centers in Geneva. Um, we're going to investigate uh, cloud federation. And, and federation, um, I guess, for the, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to talk about um, areas such as authentication, um, image management, um, networking, um, and metering are, are just some of them, right? It, federation is one of those words sort of like cloud. You can, you can put your own definition on it. So we took a broad look at what are the, the use cases um, what are the benefits of having these clouds work together? And then what services need to, to interoperate um, to meet that? Um, and then our, our aim actually um, by this time next year, which we just learned is going to be in Paris, so not too far from, from CERN's home base in Geneva, uh, would be to demonstrate um, some sort of bursting workload in a federated fashion where OpenStack is managing the federation, not um, sort of home, homegrown application-based code. Uh, to be able to burst a workload from a private-based cloud to a public cloud. So why are we doing this now, right? Um, so a little bit about my background at, at Rackspace is that I helped evolve um, a hybrid cloud that, that we developed, which is really a combination of, of dedicated or, or bare metal servers connecting to public cloud. Um, and in that, we've had a lot of, I've had a lot of conversations with customers uh, about hybrid and, and what makes sense. And what we found, or what I found, is that there are a lot of, there's a lot of interest when you talk about sort of multi-cloud federation, but a lot of those use cases are a little bit down the road. Everyone gets excited when you hear the, the concept of this, but if you ask the question, okay, what are you gonna run on this? Um, the question is often not really answered very well today. Well, with CERN, we found a use case that clearly they have the data, right? They've got the computing needs. Um, Essentially, Tim told me that any amount of resource we gave them, they could run 100% full out um, for as long as they had it. And so here's a, a great user um, that can consume this in a, in a pretty significant scale. Um, and so this is really a, a, an opportunity to sort of be at that cutting edge of, okay, here's a, a real life use case. It's um, something that we can, we can use to, to sort of push this forward in the community. So we met about a month ago and decided on um, some priorities. So if we're going to solve federation and have OpenStack as a uh, collection of, of projects um, manage federation, um, what order do we need to tackle these in? And the obvious first choice was, was identity, right? If you can't log in with the same credentials to multiple clouds, you can't really do much. Um, a good way to think about this is, is sort of like using your Facebook account to log into multiple web services, right? Um, 
Well, it's not that hard if you have two or three accounts across two or three service providers. Once you get into dozens, it gets pretty hard to manage. Not to mention that you have multiple services within each one of those clouds, right? And so identity is really the, um, the starting point. And this is sort of the, the story that we've written um, to define this. As a user, I want to take my single set of credentials and be able to access services across multiple clouds. Um, and we'll get into progress in, in just a minute, but I want to walk through kind of the top couple of priorities here first. Um, the next set is really aggregated services. So once we have the ability to take that single set of credentials and access multiple services or multiple clouds with that single login, um, one of the things I need to know about are what services are available across all of these clouds. So I want um, to authenticate using that single set of credentials, and I'd like to get a, back an answer of the full set of services available to me, um, to me based on that token, based on that identity that I have. Um, and, and sort of a, a fast follow here is I'd like to be able to take um, and, and build an image and be able to, in one place, at one time, and be able to deploy that across multiple clouds. Um, so obviously the identity work that we're, we're starting is being done within the Keystone project. Um, service catalog, um, likewise, will be done within, within Keystone. Uh, and image management is, is going to be done sort of within the Glance um, project. Um, and that's sort of where we think we'll, we'll, we hope to get within 12 months. Um, because this is a research-oriented project, it's always a good idea to, to sort of define more, um, more work than you might hope to get to. Um, and so future areas that, that we took a look at were, okay, once we have those things solved, um, there's a whole list of things within the compute service from a federation standpoint that, that could really stand to benefit um, and add value. Um, there's a lot of needs that come up around usage, right? Um, usage is complex enough within a single cloud, particularly within a service provider context where you have multiple users, but now extend that into to multiple, um, multiple clouds or multiple service providers. There's a lot more data that needs to be aggregated, um, sifted through, things like that. And then this concept of um, taking, now that I've got sort of my workload management and identity problem solved, now how can I add some business logic um, or, or policy-driven um, workload management into a system, right? So this is the idea of um, a, a rules engine um, that can talk to this federation service, potentially a, a federation service layer, um, but the idea of workload management that's, that's a part of this, this federation. Um, so let's, uh, let's jump into sort of how far we've gotten. Like I mentioned, we've been doing this for uh, about a month and, and four days um, <laughs> since our, our developer started. Um, so we have gotten the, the, the private cloud um, test environment stood up. Uh, in terms of identity, um, we've already had some really good early discussions um, with some folks listed here from IBM, uh, University of Kent, and, and Red Hat in, in sort of collaborating on the right ways to do this. Uh, we've got alignment around what some of the key requirements are. Uh, we've been through five or six uh, markdowns on those blueprints um, in terms of identity. Um, we've outlined some initial development work to be done. Um, and, and we're right at the point of, of starting to do some of that, that code development um, around these two initial use cases, right? So the first one is after I authenticate against a local CERN Keystone service, I receive a token, I can then use it um, on the Rackspace private cloud. Um, and then the second one would be, despite having an account at CERN, I want to explicitly authenticate against the Rackspace private cloud keystone, claiming that it's trusted, uh, it, it is a trusted CERN identity provider who can authenticate me. All right, so these are, we're taking very small steps um, towards a fully interoperating federation or identity service layer. Um, so next steps, obviously, continue what we're doing with identity. Um, in terms of service catalog and, and images, um, we're starting discussions now um, about um, sort of gathering input and, and what some ideas are um, to, to really figure out what the next steps are. 
And then some, some very early thoughts in this. Um, it, it's really been, I think, a, a positive thing. After four weeks, we've made some meaningful progress in terms of community discussion uh, leading up to this conference. Um, there's a couple of developer sessions tomorrow, which I've got the details on um, at the end of the, the presentation, um, where we're going to be discussing federation within Keystone. Um, and I, I think that shows that there's really kind of the right timing for this. Um, with version 3 of Keystone um, coming out and, and some previous work done in OAuth, um, this really feels like the right time where um, there's a use case for this and there's um, folks that are able to contribute and get involved in a meaningful way. Um, so why is Rackspace involved in this, right? Obviously, we're committed to OpenStack. Um, but I also just wanted to point out that um, this is really key to, to our mission as a, as a service provider as well. This is sort of our high-level strategy, and this isn't a, a corporate presentation. But I, I'm using this slide to point out um, that the first two items here um, fit very squarely into this project, right? Uh, we're about OpenStack and furthering um, the adoption of cloud and OpenStack as a standard. Um, we feel like the whole community wins um, when that happens. And that hybrid cloud is really um, something where we seek to differentiate as a company. Um, the ability to federate multiple OpenStack clouds obviously plays into that strategy as well. So um, there's obviously a, a good commitment from us because this fits strategically with what we do. Um, and in terms of hybrid cloud, this is um, sort of becoming a buzzword. Um, you guys probably don't need this slide, but, but the analysts out there also agree that, that the time is, is right for hybrid cloud, right? So we've got some quotes here from Forrester and Gardner. And these aren't specific to Rackspace, but um, the idea that users will be using multiple services from clouds, this could be SaaS and IaaS or you know, multiple SaaS providers. It's not just IaaS, but um, that this is the reality and this is the reality for some time to come. Um, so we feel that if we can really make OpenStack work together in a meaningful way, in a federated way, um, that, that it adds tremendous value um, to the community, to users of OpenStack. So what can you do? Um, if you'd like to get involved in the discussion, um, you're at the right place. Right? So um, there'll be lots more conversations this week. Uh, I've got a slide um, that has the details of some of the Keystone sessions coming up. Um, more, more will follow with, within Glance and, and, and the Nova services in the months to come, I imagine. Um, I just encourage you to, to be involved in the conversation. It's sort of the beauty of, of having this be an open source project, right? Everyone can contribute as much as they'd like to. So we encourage you to, to do that. Um, the more ideas we get, um, the, the better the, the results will be, for sure. And we do have some time for questions. So fire away. And I'll, I'll leave it with this. this is, these are the, uh, the sessions that I'm aware of. There may be some others um, that focus in on um, Keystone in particular. And these are the design sessions. So if you are a developer or contributing, um, these are certainly things that, that you'd want to potentially attend. Yes? So sort of the time to live on the token from a security standpoint? So my understanding is that as part of this work that's currently being discussed, um, then the time to live is one of the factors that are included in that. So that, yes, there is a, a risk, but there is equally a risk in the non-federated uh, scenarios also, and you ought to be able to tune that risk according to uh, who you're working with. The question was, what other clouds would we integrate between CERN and Rackspace? Um, really, we're trying to, to demonstrate um, interoperability between any number of those permutations. So currently, what we have access to are um, the, the OpenStack cloud that CERN operates, the one that we built there that, that we sort of manage for them, and then the Rackspace public cloud. 
but equally there would be additional OpenStack clouds that are managed by some of those tier one and tier two providers um, within the, the CERN network. Um, and, and ideally, if, if this becomes sort of part of future versions of Keystone and other services, that this would, would work anyone, anywhere that, that OpenStack is run. So this is the beauty of contributing upstream um, within the Open Blueprint process, which is that as this goes up and then trickles down, then this will become available for any cloud provider using OpenStack who wish to take advantage of this. So uh, amongst that, all the other high geophysics sites, for example, that are currently collaborating with us. In the back. So I think there's an important distinction between um, the open lab environment, which is a research collaboration between companies and CERN, and CERN's public procurement model, um, which is a completely separated uh, discussion. So CERN uh, and Rackspace found we had common interests in this area, and open lab provides a framework under which we explore those common interests. However, at such time as CERN would be going out to, for example, look at public cloud procurement, then that would be done through the CERN procurement rules, uh, which would follow the standard rules of public organizations and competitive tender. So in this case, Rackspace and CERN found such commonalities that uh, we uh, agreed to get going with the research project. Yeah. Hello. So uh, in SNIA or the SDC, there was a Cloud Federation related presentation. Uh, are you also looking something similar with regards to maybe SWIFT, the object store, uh, a federation which, which will move objects from one cloud to another? I think given that we've got the one year, it's already quite ambitious to do the things that we plan on doing. I, I think what's useful in going through the keystone structure first is that by doing that, we potentially enable people with other use cases to take advantage of these small steps that we're, we're doing. Um, and as I say, with it being something being done through the open blueprint process, then as with other things in the community, people can identify things that we haven't got within our plan of work and potentially contribute those also to the other projects. Okay, thanks. So there's nothing here that would preclude you doing it with Swift, but currently if we look at what we have, uh, it's primarily focused on Keystone followed by Glance, and then potentially followed by Compute and uh, Metering if we get there. So initially when the grid model was conceived, the thought was that the network would actually be the biggest problem. Um, network reliability, network limitations. In reality, it's been probably one of the most stable uh, and uh, open environments. Um, issues such as the effort it requires to run a site, uh, software maintenance. Uh, if you can imagine deploying a new version of software across 200 sites involves a lot of conference calls. Um, and so these things are becoming more of the major issues around growing, um, which means moving to a model of independent sites collaborating rather than a hierarchical structure um, is looking a lot more attractive in terms of the long-term sustainability. So I think we're flattening the hierarchy in those terms. Uh, even within the grid environment, it is already flattening uh, somewhat together. In terms of the authentication model changing, um, I think from, from CERN's use case, it would, it would be taking the Active Directory environment that they already manage and having that propagate. Um, it, I imagine this propagates already through the grid system. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, from the user experience, it wouldn't necessarily change. The software that's managing that, that identity uh, would, would, over time, migrate to OpenStack. Um, and it's probably worth noting that more and really what, um, I think Tim had a really good point um, and as part of the talk about how the grid system and the cloud system aren't necessarily competitive, they, they are fairly complementary. I think the goal, one of the goals of this that it represents for CERN is the ability to, to step back more and more over time from managing all that code themselves to more of a standard OpenStack-based solution. And so as we start to, to 
enhance some of these features around federation with an open stack, they can start to peel those back from the grid system, right? So I'm starting with authentication, but um, I, I talked about this idea of sort of workload, intelligent workload management. Well, that's something that's managed on an experiment by experiment basis within those portals and frameworks. And so developing a, an open system to do that would, would allow CERN to, to focus a lot fewer resources on managing individual experiment code and, and turn that over to, to, to OpenStack to do. So that's really kind of a, a higher level explanation of, of how this evolves over time. Yes? Right. Um, <laughs> okay, so in terms of how would the images be kept consistent, I think that one of the aspects of doing these small steps that we're doing at the moment, which is um, working through the identity federation questions and going on to the image uh, side of things, is that the aim will be to then be floating some ideas of how this could be done. And the image management, it's not clear, for example, if it's best thing to do is to have the replication of images across the various different glances, or if the best thing to do is to be replicating pointers to a, to a remote glance. This is the kind of thing that we want to be working through with the community to work out the alternative approaches. Um, so uh, I think, what was the second question? It was on, right, so. Right, on the Keystone side, I, I believe that the model is one largely of a trust structure, where you define a combination of attributes associated with an identity, and then a remote cloud can trust um, identities that match that. Um, but probably if you want details on that, uh, the design summit sessions are the ones to come along too. Um, I, I would say from a private cloud to a public cloud context, which is a, a likely use case here, Probably the, the private cloud identity service would be the trusted source, and they would ha have a, an account with a public cloud provider, but then that credential would then um, be used within the public context. Well, the, the how, like, like we mentioned, the how hasn't quite been solved yet, um, other than they would both be keystone within this context. Um, but how that works, we've written the stories for what it should look like, but the how is, is really what's being worked out right now. So we're, we are at time. Thank you for your questions. We'll be here um, to answer any more, but uh, enjoy the rest of the summer.